All right, welcome to another season of the Drew Pearson Show. We're coming to you live from Smashburgers in Uptown, 2222 McKinney. We had a great season last year, but this season's going to be even better because we've enhanced our team. We made the team even stronger. We got the great Mark Colombo as part of the team. And he's going to be presenting Columbo's Corner to us. The big news, of course, is Tony Romo signing his new contract with the Dallas Cowboys. And a lot of people have a lot of opinion about that. And my opinion is, hey, Tony, if you, they're going to give it to you, hey, take it. Because yeah. it's a tough business. And even though you're only one in three in playoff situations, <laughs> Hey, it don't matter because if you have the leverage and most quarterbacks that have been performing now in the National Football League do have that leverage and you had that leverage and that's why you're able to get that great contract with the Dallas Cowboys. And now, no pressure or anything, now we're expecting a Super Bowl. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Texas Rangers kicked off their season against the Houston Astros. They lost that game, but hey, there's 160 some games left, so I think the Rangers will get it together. And what about those Dallas Mavericks? You thought they were written off as far as making the playoff? But they're right back in the mix, along with the Los Angeles Lakers, Utah Jazz, and the Dallas Mavericks for that final playoff spot, the AC going into the playoffs, and that would keep the Mavericks playoff streak going to 13 straight seasons of making the playoffs. Man, you got to give it up to the Dallas Mavericks for even being in contention at this point because I know you all out there had them written off, including myself. Didn't think they would ever be in contention to make the playoffs. But once Dirk got back in his shape, once he found his shot again, man, the Mavericks are rolling. So a lot going on in the Metroplex as far as sports, but you know with the Drew Pearson Show, we don't just cover sports. We cover everything, including food, entertainment, cars, and we're going to do it right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show, and this is one of my favorite segments when I get to talk to two young ladies that wrote a book, What I Learned About Life. But here's the best part, when my husband got fired. We're going to find out what was the inspiration behind the book, but we have Tina Pennington, who is more referred to as Red, right? And her sister, Mandy Williams, who's referred to as Black. First of all, Tina. Mandy, what inspired y'all to write the book? Tina, it was your husband that got fired, right? Exactly. I'm, I'm not sure if I would use the word inspired. Um, <laughs> my husband came home fired. I was having the crisis of my life. And the next thing I know, I see she's taking notes. And when I ask her why she's taking notes, she informs me, oh, I think she's all going to make a great book one day. So she was telling you her problem, and you were taking notes? in the back of your mind saying, I got an idea for this. Well, she started asking me questions that started with personal finance and then went to other Life 101 topics. And she kept asking me questions, hoping I would tell her what to do. And at that point, I realized she was 40 plus years old and she needed to start making some of these decisions on her own. How cool was it to put all that together and get your book out? Well, it was pretty cool for me. I don't know how she initially <laughs> felt I had saved her our instant messages and our emails. And to this day, she wants to know if I had taped our phone conversations, and I've never quite answered that question. Tell me about the book and what it's all supposed to do as far as making us knowledgeable about finances. Well, you know, as Black said, when this all happened, I mean, I was 40 plus years old. I had a great education. That didn't stop me from just wanting her to tell me what to do. And ideally, I would have gone to a bookstore and gotten a how-to book, because then I would have had to listen to all the sarcasm mm -hmm. from her. Um, but 
but, but family can do that, right? That's what she keeps saying. <laughs> 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 <Right>. <laughs> and then before you know it, we're looking at like how I spend my time because I'm running out of hours a day and how to pay for stress and relationships. And she's just kind of forcing me to actually stop and to start thinking about things. Tell us about what the book and how kind of impact it's had. Uh, we were at a speaking engagement, and one of the women during question and answer said, why aren't these lessons taught in school? And my reply was, well, how would I know? Do I look like a teacher? And the next thing you know, we, we met with Kip Houston High School, and they asked us if we could not only develop a curriculum, but actually teach a class for their high school senior. And ultimately, it's been approved by the state as a financial literacy textbook with that wow. title. Wow, did you expect that type of uh, reception for the book? You must be kidding. I know, that's awesome, huh? Yeah. We'd be in Hollywood working on a sitcom. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate you being on the Drew Pearson Show. We'll keep up with you and, and the things that you guys are doing and the impact this book continues to have. Thank you for All right, awesome. And we'll be back with more of the Drew Pearson Show right after this. Now we're going to move on to our next segment, our special guest, a new member of the Drew Pearson Show team. You've already met him, this is Mark Colombo. Boy, that smash burger sure looked good down there, man. I have to get one of those after the show, right? Yeah. But anyway, uh, man, Mark Colombo, NFL, 10 years with the Dallas Cowboys, six with the Cowboys, four with the Chicago Bears, who drafted you number one yep. coming into the league. First of all, was that a surprise? How cool was that to be it, drafted number one? It was, it was an amazing, amazing yeah. experience, you know, being the first pick. I mean, I, I think the Chicago Bears didn't have another pick to the third round, so I was kind of in. And it was, uh, it was a great experience. Yeah, I don't know anything about that because I had to sign as a free agent, you know. I didn't get drafted, so I'm almost over that. I'm not as upset about that as I used to be. I got to move on in life. But uh, anyway, so you got into the burger business. How did that come about? Well, one of my good friends, Leonard Davis, yeah. played with me yeah. in the Cowboys for a while. We were looking for basically life after football. You know, we wanted to invest in something we believed in. And, you know, Smash Burger was it. You know, it was a really great concept, really great food, uh, really great service. And it was, you know, it was something that was a standard we wanted, you know, for our customers. And, it's, it's gone really well so far. Wow, football player, restaurateur, and also a musician is right. Is that right? Free reign. Free re How's that going? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Yeah. I've heard you guys a few times. Y'all be doing some head banging yeah. music, yeah. man. You yeah. might have been my college days with that music. <laughs> so you got a lot going on. Now you want to break into the TV business I and do. being a part of the Drew Pearson show. And I understand you've been out to the Michael Johnson Performance Center and you did an interview with a couple of your friends, offensive linemen. Yeah, I, I got an interview with uh, Jordan Mills. He's a, a young tackle. He's six, six foot six, mm -hmm. 315 pound tackle out of Louisiana Tech. And what's interesting about that story is I had a chance to coach him too. Michael Johnson called me up. He needed. He needed. A voice. Well, right on. So, uh, without further ado, let's take a look at your interview with these two guys. <laughs> Set. Good. Finish strong. Finish strong. Come on. One more. One more. One more. Come on. Set. Welcome to Columbo's Corner, and today is a special day because we're talking about the NFL Draft. And here to join me is offensive tackle from Louisiana Tech, Jordan Mills. 6'6", 315 pounds. How are we doing, Jordan? I'm doing good. How are you, Mark? I'm doing good. We get some good work out there on the field today. Yeah, very good work. You know, it's uh, old line weather outside is very cold. So we got some good work. Yeah, nice brisk Texas, Texas day. Yeah, I was able to rain with my shirt off. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, I want to talk about the process leading up to the draft. I want to start with the Senior Bowl. Now you were you were a late invite to the Senior Bowl. Now how'd that make you feel? Uh, you know, I, to get invited was an honor. It was hum humbling to be a late invite. You know, we kind of put a chip on my shoulder. I, I kind of had a little mini streak going down there, and I felt like I had something to prove. When I got down there, you know, I recognized some of the people I knew I played against. So I put my teammates with me down there. And when I got down there and when it came to Texas, it was all business from there. Yeah, we friends off the field, but hey, I'm, I came to, you know, show my talent, show them the reason why I should have been here from the first invite. And it was all business from there. It showed them how tough and nasty I was. And Take me to, you know, now we're talking about the combine prep. 
Okay, we're here at this amazing facility, Michael Johnson Performance. You know, how'd you how'd you get here? Uh, you know, I was, uh, my agents had me working out. Uh, they had their own facility. They were renting out, and uh, uh, they sent me over here. You know, some place that was quiet, no media lingering around because they got athletes here, uh, some pro athletes here, and some of you know had some of the uh, top. You know, athletes, football players in the nation, right, right. here. So it's quiet, you know, good town, you know, I can get good work in, you know. I want to segue now to the actual combine. Yeah. Okay, the viewers at home get a chance to see the 40 on television, see the 5'10'5, the three cone, the standing long jump, we have the position drills. Yeah. Okay, but what I want to talk to you about is tell me about those, the, the interview process. You know, you walk yeah. in. You walk into these rooms, okay, you have a GM, you have a head coach, you have all the scouts. You know, what What does that feel like to walk into those rooms? You know, it, it, it's a little nerve-wracking, but uh, uh, being in there with GMs and the head coaches and the coaches, because they're interviewing you for a job. They, they don't want nothing less but, for, but good players. You know, they don't want nobody with bad histories or bad reps or with bad attitude problems or whatever, anything like that. You know, they're, they're, they're coming there strictly for business because right. they, they're trying to find the best players out there to win the championship, and that's all they want. They, they come down strictly for business. You know, you know, you walk in there, you know, you're nervous, and then they'll tell you to relax, man. That's what they do. You have fun. Then you get to, they, uh, you know, break you in a little bit, start laughing and climbing, and then they'll throw up some film and just ask you some questions, you know, just to get your, their feel about you and how knowledgeable you are about the game. So it, was, it, it was a little nerve-wracking, but it was, it, it was something you know, to be around some of the, you know, the coaches you see yelling and cursing and trying to break rush necks after uh, making bad calls and just <laughs> sitting, in, sitting in here with Rex Ryan or you, you in here with uh, John Harbour or you know, his little brother Jimmy and just talking to him. It's, just, it, it, it's you know, it, it makes you speechless, but, you know, it, it's all about the process and everything like that. So we're back here from the Combine and we're doing a lot of technique work to get ready for your pro day and ultimately your mini camp. Okay, in your first mini camp, you know, you're gonna get the playbook thrown at you. Your head's gonna be spinning. Okay, you're gonna, it's, the, the speed of practice has exponentially increased. I mean, the things that happen in college and they're happening twice as fast in the pros. You know, how are you gonna handle that? How you, uh, ment I, I guess mentally, how are you gonna go into this? I just push it the best way I can, you know, and when that playbook gets thrown at me, fine, the, the first veteran, the whole lot I can and get under his wing, you know, like you say, go buy him donuts or get his favorite meal, you, you know, go. get under, get, get his, as knowledgeable, as much knowledge from him as I can, you know, because that's going to be with every rookie, you know, every, you know, they might say, oh man, he got there and he just got in there and started doing everything right, every rookie's going to stumble, so, my, my job is to approach it the best way I can and get under the coach's wing and under the veteran's wing and get all the knowledge and soak up all the knowledge I can, get in the film room, watch extra film, you know, and get under get the plays down in, uh, in the playbook. My next guest is Andre Girardi. He's a five-time Pro Bowler. Okay, he's going into his 12th season, nine of those with the Dallas Cowboys. How are we doing today, Andre? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful opportunity to be sitting here and view the illustrious Mark Colombo, the man who taught me so much about football. What do you want to know? I'm sensing a little sarcasm. No, not at all. No, no, no. I, From I, a five-time Pro Bowler. I find it funny that I'm sitting here in a calm setting with the angriest person that I've ever played football. The angriest? I mean, do I, I, I seem angry right now? You know, that's a trick question. I'm not going to answer that quickly. Now we're talking about the NFL draft. Can you take me back to 2002 and tell me about the process you know, you went through leading up to the draft? Oh man, it was a very strenuous process. Uh, the workouts, the training, and nobody can really prepare you for you know, the draft. Game, you know? Especially when you're sitting there and you're watching how everybody go ahead of you. You know, players like yourself, you know, you don't have to wait too long. You know, I have to wait from about 11 o'clock to somewhere around 5 o'clock. Well, I, that, that was my next question. Do you yeah. still have a chip on your shoulder that was no, drafted eight picks ahead of you? No, not at all. You know, I mean, we're talking eight play. picks, but it's a whole round. Is that it, the problem? It's a whole round. Yeah, it's a whole different. Now, the yeah. only outcome that You'll I always be a second round pick. I'll always be a second round pick. Okay. But the only thing that I can say is that I'll be first in yard because we beat you guys 62 to 36. Yeah, I told you. Uh, you know, he's talking about he's talking about Boston College versus Colorado. The, the draft process, as we were talking about, um, it is very difficult. It's very hard because you never know where you're going to go. You have all these experts that say, 
you're supposed to go here and these teams are interested mm -hmm. in you. The only thing that you can control is putting out your best effort anytime and everywhere a team wants to see you. Well, you're right. Now let's uh, let's talk about now you're a five-time Pro Bowler. Mm -hmm. You're going into your 12th season. Mm -hmm. Nine of those with the Dallas Cowboys. Can you can you tell us what it was like to play the majority of your career here in Dallas? It was it was absolutely amazing uh, to play to be from Texas and play for the biggest team in the state of Texas. Um, the fans, the support, the teammates, the fights with you, of course, uh, the arguments we were giving you. But it was it was a great time. Um, had a had a great time. It was a lot of a lot of fun, a lot of time. You know, one of the things I want to talk about is. There's a lot that happens from the huddle to the line of scrimmage through the snap, okay? And I get this question all the time. You know, there's a lot of pointing going on. There's a lot of, you know, the quarterback saying one thing, the center saying the other, tackles are pointing and everything. You know, you know, what is going on at the line of scrimmage that everyone's so caught up with? You know, you know, why is the play changing? You know, can you give us a little insights that you are a center and you do, you are the quarterback basically for the offensive line. You get us all lined up. And in, in essence, you tell the quarterback where he has to go to in the identification of the front. So can you give us a little insight on you know, what it's like to be a center? Um, and to sum it up clearly, it's controlled chaos. <laughs> so you get the play, you're going to the line, of course, we had a different balance. So right. um, a lot of the terms that we used, they weren't in the playbook. Um, defenses couldn't catch on to them. One turn may mean six or seven different things to you. Right. Right? That particular play you would have to and so, uh, getting to play, you know, communicating with the guys around you, talking to you specifically, you talking back to me, us changing the calls, and then us giving that information to the quarterback and then the play just starting. And you would think there would be a process of two or three minutes and all right. that happens. Yeah, split second. 30 seconds, sorry, 30 seconds. Yeah, I don't think, you know, the, the viewer at home actually realized what goes on, how many calls are made, how many different adjustments, you know, the defender can line up in a different position than you anticipated. Certain things can happen, and it is. It's, it's almost like, you know, it's like a whole mathematical equation every time, and, you know, bits and pieces keep changing, so. Yeah, it's it's good. Obviously, we were together for a long time. Like you said, we had our own form of communication. And uh, I, that kind of I want to take to the next point. You know, what do you think about the Cowboys' offensive line right now? Um, I think a young, it's a young group. I think they have a, a number of athletic guys mm -hmm. out there that can play. I just think they need time to really mold together right. and figure out their own identity. One of the things that we had to fight through when we became a, a group was we had to fight to gain our own identity. Right. And it was, you know, those five guys on that line locked themselves in that, that room, and we really didn't care who had the ball, who ran the ball, who caught the ball. It was about our group and what we had to do. All right, welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. Man, what a great interview. Did you have fun doing that with those guys? Yeah, I had fun. That was actually you know, my, my first two interviews you know, mm -hmm. uh, as a broadcaster here on the Drew Pearson Show, and it was, uh, it was exciting. Good uh, job, man. Right on. I appreciate it. And the Drew Pearson Show will continue right after this. All right, welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. We're at Smash Burgers in Uptown. We're having a great time. We're hosted by the great Mark Columba, one of his many Smash Burger restaurants throughout the Metroplex. And this is one of my favorite segments. Call it the Weekender. Right. And uh, it's more about entertainment, about movies, and we got a movie that you're going to highlight. That's right. This movie is coming out this weekend. It's called The Evil Dead, and mm. it's a remake of the 1981. Some people call it a classic. It's a good time down in Austin talking about barbecue, beer, and blood. All right. Well, let's take a look. All right. 
right, well, congratulations on the film. I know there was a lot of anticipation about this, and some people were, weren't quite too sure what to think about, you know, the series either continuing, whether you call it a remake, reimagining, whatever. But uh, I guess with the audience reaction last night, it's safe to say that this is a hit with the fans. So do you feel like a sense of relief now? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. What's it like to, to see that on the big screen with a full audience? Because, I mean, it's... It gets a little nuts. I think you like couldn't ask for anything better yeah. mm -hmm. as like a filmmaker or an actor or like an artist to show your work and to have people screaming and, and Austin laughing Williams. and just, yeah, screaming. like it it really felt good. Well, that's great, and it looked like it was a whole lot of fun to make, right? I, I imagine that you probably each have something, some particular day, some particular scene that probably will always stay with you when people ask you years from now, hey, what about the evil dad? When we had to go back and I had to s smash Smash Olivia's head in, that was, right. that was pretty Actually, great. I remember it. this is something that you haven't talked about yet, is um, you, to keep yourself in it, would jump rope Skip. off the Oh my god, yeah, I was running around everywhere. Yeah. yeah, it was intense. Oh, yeah. But you had to, because some of the scenes would be like, okay, uh, action. You'd walk into a room and go, <gasps> and that's it, <laughs> and that's it. So it was like, how do you get yourself ready to do that? So I was jump, yeah, just jumping rope running around. <laughs> you guys have a good rapport together, and, and here you are, you get to hang out in South by Southwest. Is there anything in particular Austin-esque you'll get to do? Any kind of barbecue, anything? We have the Texas barbecue, went yeah. to Stubbs, yeah. Scouts. I want Got to a truck hat. So yep. Okay. Actually, I think you have it, don't you? Look. Uh-oh. There it is, the Stubbs hat. <laughs> there, that's we were I'm there. hanging out with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. We're hanging out. Um, it's, good. it's gonna be a good time. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I know we gotta wrap up. I really appreciate it. And uh, have a fun South by Southwest. Thank, thank you. you. Well, congratulations on the film. This, There's been a lot of anticipation about this one. And some people aren't quite too sure about it, but after the reaction last night, I think it's safe to say that, that horror fans are just gonna eat this up. Do you feel a sense of relief now, now that South by Southwest has sort of kicked this off? Yeah, definitely. Having been blessed by the ultimate audience, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it makes us feel good, like we didn't screw up. But but do you ever think about that either when there's so much discussion and, and worry and concern and that kind of thing, or do you just kind of just chalk it all up? I to think them? fans were more concerned than we were. Um, but we're going to certainly take their needs into account. And, you know, as producers for the original one, we want to make sure there were certain elements that were there and yet allowing Fede to do a whole new take on it. Kind of the only rule was that I want to make sure that every, you know, horrific moment of the movie was going to be followed by one that was even more horrific. So then it's kind of, so if you start quite high, then that has to keep climbing and keep climbing and keep climbing. It gets to a moment after 90 minutes, then it gets to crazy places. We, it was some, it, that, that was the only rule for us, writing. I want to make sure that nothing, you know, if something happened after something, and the second thing is just, it's less brutal than the previous scene, it just feels like, oh, what? So we want to make sure that it was always escalated. And I think a lot of horror fans will be happy to know that there, there are many, real effects on there. It's not a whole lot of what appears to be CG or anything like that. Was that really important to you as well? Oh yeah, definitely. It was very important because I don't think people are scared of CGI. You know, there's uh, movies where they have CGI monsters and, and it was all, oh, the movie was great until they bring the CGI monster, right? And, and those images, they sell tickets sometimes because people, they see something new in a computer and they, they, they are attracted by it. But, you know, at the end of the day, we want a movie that lasts long, that stays in the archives of filmmaking for, for ages, like the original three movies. You know, I don't want my movie to age faster than the original, so that would be terrible. So they have to, you know, you have to, there's a legacy to, to continue. And, and, and if you make a, you put some CGI, you're always going to be convinced that it looks great. And three years from now, it's not going to look that good. And 10 years from now it's gonna be unwatchable so you don't want that so that that's why that, that was the other, the other reason why not to use you know Bruce was there a temptation for you to be in this one in some sort of capacity? not to me no no I did we all thought it was very important to let Freddie come up with a whole new world we didn't want to saddle anybody with anything or distract we felt me being in it would actually be a distraction but I think that isn't the series going to continue with the sequel to to your films as well it could Sam Raimi makes a lot of points old statements, but you know, he's busy making big Hollywood movies right now. I saw this when I was working on a TV show in Miami, I saw a first version of it. My first thoughts were, thank God. 
Because Fetty's first version of this movie to show to us was only 90 minutes long. Most directors turn in a 120 minute opus and you have to just hack it down and hack it down. This is a movie that never wanted to be more than 90 minutes. And so that's when we knew that Fetty, get, he gets it. This movie moves along. They have to. This is the genre that does it. It's not time to be ponderous. It's true. And it does. And congratulations on the film. And thank you so much for your time. Oh. The Evil Dead. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if this one's actually going to get you out in theaters. I think last time you told me the last movie you saw in right. theaters, Jerry Maguire. Jerry right? Maguire, yes. Don't tell nobody that, though. Uh, <laughs> the next few weeks, we're going to see a lot of activities on the weekend section. All right. We look forward to that. Yeah. And we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. This is Michael Nass. Welcome back, first of all. Thanks, Drew. I appreciate it. Uh, our first question comes from Mike on Facebook, and he asks, do you think the Cowboys with the 18th pick should select safety or an offensive line? I think the Cowboys should uh, select an offensive lineman. If you're going to give Romo 108 million, 50-some million guaranteed, you need to protect that commodity. And the way to do that is start building through the offensive line. Don't go out and get free agents, make shift guys, but find guys that you can develop and make them good football players so that they can do the job and protect Tony Romo. Great, great. And Cleb, uh, who is Thorpe, 84, uh, on Twitter asks, do you think Des Bryant will be a top five wide receiver in 2013? Without a doubt. You know, he's doing all the right things. Actually, uh, it started last year. You could see it come on with him. He all of a sudden started to get it. You know, not only what he was doing on the field, but what he was doing off the field as well. So there's no question in my mind he gets it. He's had a good offseason so far. If he stays healthy, there's no question. He had 1,300 yards last season, and he was kind of beat up here in there you know he had his injury problems but if he can stay healthy throughout the course of a regular season there's no question he can get that 1300 again maybe even more yeah, I don't know if you saw it or not uh, this was on TMZ with uh, Michael Crabtree yeah and uh, they were barking that they were the two best receivers in the NFL well I like that confidence because I used to talk that same kind of noise back in the day <laughs> Yes. Yes. Thank you for all that and all the great questions, man. All and welcome right. back to the Drew all Pearson right. Show. Our social media director, Michael Nass, with some great questions that you presented on Just Ask Drew. And we're going to wrap up the Drew Pearson Show right after this. Welcome back to the Drew Pearson Show. We're wrapping up our first show of the season. It's turned out to be a great show. Great Mark. job, guys. Man, what a great uh, contribution to the first show. But anyway, thanks, guys, for being part of the Drew Pearson Show. We want to thank Smashburger. We want to thank Best Buy, Dodge City of McKinney, Lombardo's, Ty Williams Financial, Anderson's Furniture as well. We had a great time here at Smashburger. Join us next week right here on the Drew Pearson Show.